Th thank you so much for your kind words and good morning to everyone. I'm very happy to be here in Bhubaneswar and in the state of Odisha. I'm no, uh, I'm no stranger to the Indian subcontinent. As uh, your colleague Balakrishnan said, I've been was involved for many years in the peace process in Sri Lanka, so I had frequent visits to India to discuss Sri Lanka with Indian leaders. But I always dreamed of coming to Bhubaneswar because it's well known as one of the four most temple cities in the world. And I think this cultural heritage is so inspiring, so interesting. Uh, and I know it, this is not just one of the centers in India, but really one of the cultural centers in the world. Of course, also a very important historical center of India with the Kalinga Wars. And now a state which is rapidly moving ahead with economic and social progress. So I think the entire delegation, we are really inspired and enthusiastic to be here with you, to learn from you, and to share some of our ideas with you. If you cannot understand my English with Norwegian accent, uh, please tell me. My children are every day telling me, oh, you speak English so poorly. You should go somewhere else, my, my daughter says. But if you can't understand, you, you tell me. I, I'll try to speak more slowly. Uh, I will start with disclosing, disclosing one of the most well-hidden facts in the world, particularly if you look into media, and that is the following. The world has never, ever been a better place. We are rapidly moving ahead on every indicator where we can measure progress. We are much richer than the average person in the world, the average person in Odisha, is much taller, much fatter, but basically for good, much better educated, and in much better health than at any point in human history. This can be documented by all possible facts. It's not disclosed by the media, but it's in a very, very important starting point. And if you want the most important of all facts, when I was born, life expectancy on the planet was 46. Life expectancy at, in India at the time would have been around 40. Now life expectancy in India is rapidly moving towards 70, and the global average has passed 70. Indeed, in a previous very, very poor nation like South Korea, the average woman can now expect to reach the age of 90. Not just that some very lucky women reach the age of 90. But on average, you can reach the age of 90. This is, of course, because of enormous global success, particularly in defeating the global transmittable diseases. First time I visited India, there were hundreds of thousands of polio cases in India alone. Last year, how many? Not one. Zero. And the same with nearly all the big killers of humanity historically, the tuberculosis, the yellow fever, the smallpox, the measles, the malaria, they're all dra dropping at a speed no one thought possible. There have been more progress on human development from I was born, and of course this has nothing to do with me <laughs> up to today, than there were from Buddha was born up to our times. And we should celebrate this progress. can cite any number of examples. Let me shop in on one very poor nation, Ethiopia in Africa. Ethiopia has 100 million people, so it, it counts. The present government of Ethiopia has reduced child mortality by two-thirds in 20 years. That saves more lives than all dying in all global wars combined. But of course, the perspective on the world matter. If you look to the world from Shanghai, the rapidly searching Chinese economy, of course, the world looks as a brilliant place. If you look to the world from Aleppo in the midst of the civil war of Syria, of course, it looks as a very, very horrible spot. So there are suffering, there are enormous progress, uh, but the average human do being is doing better and better on all way of calculating. And adding to that, the world is also a much more peaceful place 
than at any other point in human history. We are caused following the horrible events of terrorism and some wars. But they kill much fewer people than wars did in human history. Indeed, the chance of an individual human being, say you, of dying in war or terrorism has, or any other violence, being killed by your wife, by, killed by your son, by, killed by some neighbor, uh, the chance of dying in violence of any individual human being has never, ever been as low as it is today. In Europe, we have an enormous focus on terrorism. The amount of people killed in terrorism in Europe last year was the same as 17 hours of road accidents. No one are afraid to go to Europe because of road accidents. But I know a lot of people who don't want to go to France because there have been two horrible terrorist attacks in France. Let's start with this because we need to take celebration of progress into account. And if there is one place to celebrate peacefulness, this is really the place, India. If there was a place destined for some problems, uh, I think India would have been a prime candidate. There are 200 million Muslims in India, more than in any other Muslim nation except Indonesia. There are more Sikhs in India than there are Jews in the entire world. There are more Christians in India than there are Christians in all of Northern Europe combined. Add to that the Giants and the Parsis and any other group, and put on top of that about 1,000 million Hindus. Uh, the potential for conflict is immense. But the fact is, that there has been hardly any major conflict in India since independence, killing an large number of people. There, have been, there are problems in some few areas, but overall, this is an enormous en uh, part of the world. The population of India is bigger than the, much bigger than the population of Africa, much bigger than the population of the Americas combined, much bigger than Europe, and largely at peace. What an achievement by you, but also caused by all the great leaders of India since independence to keep this great nation together, making a national consciousness and avoid conflicts. But obviously, everything is not just good. We have major challenges, and let me point to three. Number one, while the average human being uh, is much better off than in the past, Still, we have about 1 billion people on planet Earth, 800 million is the exact number, living in abrupt, extreme poverty. That must stop. There is no coincidence that out of the 17 so-called development goals, sustainable development goals made by the United Nations, goal number one is eradicate poverty by 2030. We are well on the track to do it, thanks to China, among uh, more than everyone else, but also thanks to India, thanks to many other places in Asia, but there is also a rapid uh, progress in other, other parts of the world. But we must never forget this, living in extreme poverty, where you don't know what you will eat tomorrow, where you have no real decent housing, when you cannot bring your children to education, and when you will die from diseases which are completely curable for a very small fee. To be cured from, for instance, HIV costs basically nothing, but still it's not affordable for quite a few people on the planet. So we need to get out of extreme poverty. Adding, we need to get out of extreme poverty in such a way, and be, the rest of us being prosperous, in such a way that we do not destroy this planet. We cannot add to climate change, making the planet a warmer place. We cannot destroy the environment. We cannot pollute this planet, because if we do that, we undermine the foundation for getting out of poverty. As an example, pollution is now the biggest killer of humanity, because we have been so successful in defeating the transmittable diseases, Pollution is the biggest killer, 7 million people on planet Earth. It's not my figure, it's the World Health Organization. And World Health Organization say 7 million people die prematurely because uh, of pollution. And Indian cities are polluted. Bhubaneswar is not the most polluted, 
but you also will have pollution issues to resolve here. And of course, the big cities like Mumbai or, or, or Delhi are severely polluted. So we need to take care of Mother Earth, this small, vulnerable planet, while at the same time defeating uh, uh, poverty. And we need to protect the environment, the beauty of the land, the beauty of the nature. How can we be the one, gen gen one generation which wipes out wildlife, destroy the elephant or the tiger or the pangolin or the polar bear back home in Norway, whatever big species we have, or for that matter, all the small uh, and important uh, plants, animals we do have. We need to protect them all. So we have this huge challenge building upon the success of humanity in the last few decades to protect the planet and build prosperity at the same time. How do we do that? Let me suggest that the overall uh, recipe for success was put forward by American President Barack Obama when I listened to him a few months back. He said, my two young daughters, their names are Sasha and Malia, he said, uh, when I speak to them about acid rain, which is, of course, the huge pollution we did have in North Europe and, and, uh, and America in the past, when I speak to them about acid rain, he said, well, they look another way. They look to TV, they do something else because they don't understand what I'm talking about. And then they said, but by the way, that was the main environment issue in my time. When I came into politics as a young student from Hawaii or into Harvard, that was the topic we focused, about, focused on. Why aren't my children interested? Because the problem is resolved. There is no acid rain in the United States of America in, or indeed in Europe anymore because politicians took action. And the recipe for success, in my view, is a three-layer success. You need citizens' action, which means that people-centered politics where you make it possible for people to act, people to form coalitions, to act, to speak to the politicians. So you need actions of citizens. Secondly, you need political leadership. The most successful nations on the planet are those with a great leadership. I think India at the moment has a very strong leadership in uh, Prime Minister Modi and downwards. That helps. Political leadership is key. And thirdly, you need the forces of the market and business because the innovation, the new technology you need will nearly always be done by business as, private, as public sector guys, as bureaucrats, as UN people. Well, there's a lot of good to be said about us, but we are normally not the persons who are the innovative people of business. I mean, who made the digital revolution in the world? Was it President Jimmy Carter or President Ronald Reagan? Or was it these young crazy guys in California, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and all this? They even left university early because they were afraid that the digi digital revolution will go past them. They left university and started small businesses. These businesses, by the way, are now the biggest businesses in the world. The dominating companies in the world today did not exist only 20 years back. Google did not exist 20 years back. The name was not there. Now it's probably the most valuable company in the world based on stock exchange value. China's Alibaba, which is really feeding products to this enormous land, again, did not exist 20 years back. And I could go on go on. Just recently, a new statistics for the world show that the richest person in the entire world is Mr. Bezos, the head of Amazon in the United States. And I don't think Amazon existed 20 years back either. I haven't checked, but it cannot be uh, more than about 20 years since it was formed. So my point here is we need to mobilize citizens. We need political leadership. It's key. But we need the forces of business and market to drive innovation and new products. Let me then suggest three main kind of, let's say, slogans or three policy requirements before I go to the more specific. I think we need a can-do politics. I need a, think we believe a politics where we are in it together. 
And I think we need a pol political uh, uh, atmosphere where we focus on the sustainable development. What does this mean? We need can-do politics. We have lots and lots of polit pol politicians and UN bureaucrats and civil service who just push around papers in the world. You push a paper from one side of the desk to the other and you think, we think we have done something great. We need leadership at all levels to focus on what can be done. Environmentalists, I mean, these are my good friends, whether they are in India or wherever they are, some of them are brilliant in describing the problems on the world. Sometimes telling us that we are on the way straight to hell if we don't act. But what we need is not to describe the problems, but the can-do atmosphere of what can be done. And then acting upon it. So my, my, my strong advice in statement to you, to ministers, to civil servants, try to embrace this can-do atmosphere. The great Indonesian president, Mr. Yodiono, even made this the name of his autobiography. He said, can-do politics. And that's number one. Second, we need to realize that we are in the main issues together. We are in it together globally. Think of the craziness of the statement by the President of the United States of America. I mean, all due respect to him. When, when he withdrew from the Paris Agreement, he said that China and India is to be blamed. They are not acting uh, accordingly on climate. And exactly the opposite is the case. China and India are now the leaders on climate action. Nowhere else you see such a rapid move into renewable energies, to solar, to wind, maybe more in wind in India, China than in India, uh, to natural gas, to all the renewable energy sources. It's led by China and India. And it's China and India which has made the price come down so fast that this is no, uh, cannot compete with coal everywhere in the world. But Mr. Uh, Mr. the American president wanted to blame China and India rather than the policies we need is to embrace each other. When I go to China, sometimes I hear people blaming the United States for all, all problems. Here in India, sometimes I hear people blaming China for a lot of problems. The United States, they blame, also tend to blame China. Forget all this. Let's focus on what we can do ourselves and what we can do together. Together we can resolve any problem on planet Earth. If we allow ourselves to blame each other, to make conflict with each other, there is nothing we will be able to resolve. One of the biggest success stories of environment is the so-called Montreal Protocol. That was some scientist saying that the ozone layer is in jeopardy, it is very dangerous, we will get uh, a lot of radiation to the planet, which will give us skin cancer. Then politicians, in the beginning, were very reluctant. Business said, no, this is very dangerous. Some American companies said that the American way of life will be destroyed if we act on this. But then gradually the scientists built the case, media picked it up, there was a civil movement of people saying we, we, this problem must be resolved, and then finally in 1987, the all governments came together and acted on this, and it's a huge success. Now the ozone layer is coming back. Latest pred predicament is that by 2050 it will be fully back in this uh, stage as it was. And we have, we have avoided 2 million cases of skin cancer every year on the planet because of this act. It's a show of what we can achieve if we act together. So don't allow us to be split into different uh, nationalities fighting each other, then we'll achieve nothing. But the same also apply to the relationship between government and business and civil society. We can only resolve problems together. Business and government must work hand in hand. Those nations who have been able to set up really good relationship between business and governments, where there is a conversation, a dialogue, when government wants to regulate markets, which government should do, they don't just do it like that, but they go into a dialogue with business as to what will help, what's the right way of achieving our common aim. 
those are the most successful. Germany is such a nation. Germany is probably taking more resolute action on the environment than any other nation on the planet. And they've turned it into an enormous business opportunity, an engine of German business. Germany is now, uh, uh, is now exporting products from the environment industry all over the world, thanks to the fact that they cleaned up the Rhine or, or acted on, on, on the environment. But of course, Germany has the ability for the government and business to work together, set common aims, uh, not fight each other, but work together. So I think together in the world, together in a nation, and I'm very, very happy to be here with the delegation of some key business people from the French um, uh, well-known, well-reputed bank, um, uh, BNP Paribas, uh, and from all other institutions to look into how we can help uh, uh, the state of Odisha in gathering capital from global actors, but investing in Odisha in such a way that it helps transformation of Odisha into more prosperity and a, and a better agriculture. Sata Tripathi sitting on the first uh, um, uh, bench there is a, uh, is a boy of the soil. I mean, he came from Odisha ori originally. He's the driving force behind this. Longer back in the uh, audience there, you see the managing director of BNP Paribas uh, in, uh, in, in India. Uh, and we have other med members of the delegation. But there is no way we can resolve problems just the public sector or just the, uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the private sector. And this is an experience from everywhere else in the world. And to be, I mean, to be a little bit uh, also maybe impolite to India, this is also the experience of India, because India lacked development for very long, because India did not dare to embrace the private sector. It closed itself down until the 1990s, and had a, at the government level far too reluctant view on business, in, in my view, and in, in there has been suffering from that, because that's completely changed. Man Man Singh came in as the finance minister, the present BJP government or Prime Minister Modi has a completely different attitude, and that serves India much better. But then over, over the entire world, those places which have not a strong government, they are suffering, those who have not a vibrant business sector are also <coughs> suffering. We need both. And please have a dialogue with your business as to how you can uh, move forward, and we will be happy, happy to help. So can do attitude, working together, and then we need to clearly define our goal, which is in a very fine word, sustainable development. I have been a visitor to India for many, many years. Uh, and I, again, in some bluntness, for very long India got the debate wrong. The debate in India for very long was, should we develop fast or should we protect the environment? And of course, when you put the answer, uh, a question like that, you will f find a few environmentalists who give priority to environment, but the vast majority of people will give priority to development. But the question is wrongly put. There is nothing like that choice anymore. It may have been a right choice in the past, but in present day, there is no choice to be made between development and environment. We can achieve both with the same policies. And the most successful nations in the world are no, those now which are re moving very, very fast. I pointed to Germany. Germany is number one protector of the environment, but everyone, of course, is really envious of the German economy. China has polluted a lot, but is now rapidly changing into environment-friendly policies. And Pre President Xi of China has made the main slogan of an ecological civilization. And has seen, he has said that green forest and clean rivers, that's the new gold. So this melting together of environment and development is absolutely key. And let me, towards the end of what I would say, go through a few sectors to look into how in practical terms, not just in slogans, how in practical terms we can bring together environment and development. Because there is no choice to be made. We can do both with the same, uh, same means. Energy is key. Still quite a good number of people in the state of Odisha are not, not connected to the grid. 
Of course, you need more energy if you want to search in industries, in transportation, and in many other areas. There is no way any nation can really have a huge economic progress without energy. My nation, Norway, was built on hydroelectrical power. We had enormous amount of it, and it did drive our economic development for many, many decades. So there is no doubt we need more energy, to, and the right to energy is the right for everyone. Secretary General, the former Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, once said that he learned to read and write at the candlelight in Korea after the war in Korea. And true, it's possible. There's any number of people on the planet to read, to learn and write at the candlelight. But it's much, much easier to study if you have an electrical bulb uh, in your apartment and maybe a TV set and maybe a connection point for your mobile phone uh, and a way to uh, realize the world through, in uh, through internet. So electricity matters. And the good news is now price of renewables have come down to a level where they are completely compatible uh, with uh, coal. Because renewables have huge other advantages. When we install a solar plant, we don't take the real cost into uh, calculation. If you have a solar plant, you need to, what, what does it cost to clean all the windows of a city which is polluted by a coal power plant? What does it cost to treat in hospitals all those who get asthma or strokes because of the pollution from the power plant? This is never counted. But even if we let that aside, we just look to the hardcore calculation of finances as they will be done by the Wall Street, solar can now compete with coal for new installations everywhere in the world. And here in India we see the new airport in Kochi in, uh, in Kerala being all solar. The biggest singular solar plant in the world is in the state of Tamil Nadu. State of Andhra Pradesh, your neighboring state, is rapidly moving ahead. Andhra Pradesh has 11% economic growth Every state, every nation in the world is envious with that fantastic result. And they are rapidly going into solar and other renewable energies. And Prime Minister Modi has made a global international solar alliance with France and is promoting these, uh, uh, these policies at the, uh, at the national level. So a lot is happening and solar is the future. Also in the United States of America, there are now five times more jobs in the solar industry than in the coal industry. So locking yourself into coal is to be in the past. Embracing the solar industry is the future, and the price will just continue to go down because size matters. I remember when Prime Minister Modi launched uh, the, the, uh, the lead lamp program. Uh, there were a few tens of thousands of lead lamps in India. Then, when that program was launched, all of a sudden there were 200 million lead lamps produced in India. What was the effect? I mean, everyone knows the price, of course, fell like that because it matters so much whether you produce 200 million or 10,000. Uh, so I think the price came down to less than 10% on the original price, and that's exactly the effect we are now seeing in solar and in wind. And this is all over the planet. Morocco is a front runner on, on solar energy. United Arab Emirates are huge, making a huge plant uh, in the Ar Arab desert. The new metro of Santiago de Chile is run on solar. So there is no reason to be reluctant to embrace the future. And of course here you drive economic development, provide green growth and protect the environment with one policy, which is the renewable policy. Agriculture, secondly, is of course a key sector in the state of uh, Odisha. I don't know the exact number, but still a huge part of your population will be working in agriculture. Uh, to drive agriculture into a more sustainable, less use of chemicals, fertilizer will definitely be used, but it can be you can reduce the amount of it by employing new, well-tested methods. We just saw a, a presentation yesterday from Andhra Pradesh and how it's done there, and there is huge potential in making the agriculture much more environment friendly, and add production. No one is asking you to say you should just have a few trees and a, 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 some very low productive plants. 
is just to move into a more environment-friendly production, which yields more and costs less, because, of course, fertilizer, chemicals, etc., are expensive. It's not that you should not use any of this, but it's to, uh, to reduce the volume. And this is, of course, one of the uh, great potentials of this uh, investment scheme, which we uh, are proposing to the, we should just propose to the chief minister and propose in a discussion uh, with, with you. So, energy, agriculture. Third is forest. That's an area where Odisha has made huge step forward. So you have a huge tree cover, and one of the big, biggest in, in the, uh, India, for sure, particularly in the, in, in the sub subcontinent. And this is a core issue for the world, because 20% of the emissions driving climate change are coming from forest. Forest, is, forest are the homes of most of the species we want to protect. And destruction of forest also in some places creates for, uh, forest fires and, and huge huge pollution in Indonesia, for instance. And here there is also a lot of good news. Brazil, the biggest forest nation on planet Earth, has reduced deforestation by 70%. No one thought it possible. Brazil did it by government decision, a strong leadership from President Lula and other leaders, and they did it also. And here there may be some lessons learned for Odisha. They did it by empowering the local people. Uh, the Indian tribes in the Amazon get the possibility to protect their forest, because they cannot do that in conflict with the state. State in Brazil is much stronger than the tribes. But when the tribes and the state work together, meaning that the people on the ground is the first line protector of the forest, but police and army is the second line protector of the for forest, then you get these great results that you have had uh, had in uh, Brazil. But Odisha has done very well in this area, uh, uh, but we need to take that policy globally. We need to do replanting in many areas and to protect the historical natural forest, which are still there in Brazil, uh, Indonesia, Africa, and many other uh, places. This is also about protecting the species. We are shrinking the land where the animals can live. Uh, we are going into, as humans, into trade uh, in uh, animal products. Some of this completely silly. Lots of people in China and Vietnam until very recently, for instance, have believed that you have a lot of health effect by eating rhino or, or, or ivory powder. Because there is not the slightest scientific proof that if you eat powder from the elephant uh, 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 ivory, you can get cured for cancer and a disease. It won't help at all. But the, the uh, idea is there out with people. So it's a huge job to educate people, to get them to understand that this won't help to destroy the market. And of course, for the police to go after the gangs and criminals who do this trade. We need to protect the forest, but we also need to protect, um, protect uh, the different species. There is a success story here in India, and that is tigers. The tiger population of India is now gradually, not big, but gradually coming up. It was an animal close to extinction, but it's coming up. And I will really pay tribute to you because tiger is one of the most difficult species to, to protect. Because tigers kill humans. Tigers is a very dangerous animal. Tigers need huge space. So to protect tigers is not easy, and that's why it's so uh, commendable that India has been successful. China, by the way, has been very successful on uh, the pandas, which also was close to extinction, but is now coming back. So there are success stories like tigers and pandas, but overall we are not doing well on protecting wildlife, and that's another reason to protect the forest of Odisha and, and the world. So, fourthly, transportation is a key area if you want to go uh, make a more environment-friendly uh, future. Indian cities are uh, polluted. We need to move into other sorts of mobility. Of course, the, the great inspiring example in the world here is now China. 65% of all high-speed rail in the world is in China. Every city in China the size of Bhubaneswar it's now connected uh, to the high-speed rail. Very soon, every city in China, more than 500,000 people will be connected to the high-speed rail. It takes you 
now four and a half hour from Shanghai to Beijing, and that will be a similar, more or less a similar distance as from, as from Bhubaneswar to Delhi, four and a half hour by rail, if India had the same high-speed rail as China has built. It's not an easy thing to do in one, uh, it cannot be done in one year, but it's to set the eyes on what, what, is, what is possible. First time I visited China, China had one metro line in the entire land. That was under the Tiananmen, the main street of Beijing, there there was one metro line. Now the two biggest metro systems on the planet is Beijing and Shanghai. They're building 100 kilometers of new metro every year, both in Shanghai and in Beijing. And there are 30 cities in uh, China, many of them the size of Bhubaneswar, who now have metro systems, of course not as big as Shanghai or, or Beijing, but still functioning metro systems. Latin America spearheaded other technologies, they have bus lanes, these are cheaper, more fast to achieve, bus lanes with metro standard, so we have platforms where you enter into the bus, reserved streets from the bus, this was invented in Brazil and in Colombia, very useful technologies. China is very rapidly moving into uh, electrical, uh, electrical and, uh, bikes, which can replace motorbikes, uh, and we are rapidly moving to a future with electrical vehicles. The faster we embrace this, the more successful it will be. Norway, my nation, has the biggest number of electrical vehicles of any nation in the world per capita. That's because of government policies, where we made electrical vehicles cheaper compared to um, historical or, or gasoline-driven cars, and we introduced the right uh, for electrical vehicles to go in the bus line, so there were cl clear, uh, clear benefits for people to embrace them. So while this cannot, of course, not be achieved in one, one day, one year, it will need an all of India effort, but still let me encourage you to look to what China has achieved here, which is miraculous, all of China rail network, metros in big, big cities, and the movement into electrical vehicles and electrical buses and electrical, electrical uh, motorbikes. And for sure, if this can happen in China, there's not the slightest reason why it cannot, it, why it cannot happen in India. You are as, for sure as indigenous uh, as, the, as the Chinese. Lastly, I started by saying that Bhubaneswar is world-renowned uh, for its temples. Tourism is one of the main drivers of the economy today. And tourism has one enormous benefit which people don't uh, uh, remember very often. It's a fantastic job creator. There's any number of jobs to be had in the tourist sector. If you were to establish a huge car factory here in Bhubaneswar, uh, the number of people employed will be very limited. Because the modern car factories, you have a few robots running around making, making the cars and a few people uh, looking into the robots. But even the smallest hotel has a huge amount of employees. Even a small restaurant has many employees. And of course there is any number of jobs for taxi drivers or rickshaw drivers or whatever it may be in the tourist industry. For tourist guides, it's an enormous driver of jobs. There is one million young people joining the job market in India every month. All of them have the same aspirations as you and me. They want a job. They want to provide for the family, they want to do something interesting in their life, and for sure they need some money. They need jobs. And tourism is an enormous vehicle for that, and tourism can of course be run in a much greener fashion than we do today, so green tourism is also a huge vehicle for sustainable growth. So, to summarize, in energy, in transport, in forests, in, uh, um, in agriculture, in tourism, in all these main sectors of the economy, there is an enormous potential for creating jobs, bringing people out of poverty, bringing people up in the middle class, uh, while at the same time protecting the environment, making the environment better, and making the planet green at the same time. The one problem we need to fix was put very clearly by the great Indian sage, sage uh, Mahatma Gandhi. He said, and you know it very famously, the planet has enough for everyone's need, but the planet does not have enough for everyone's greed. That's why we need politics to control the greed of people, 
to make sure that we jointly move in the right direction, that we are in it together. But on that basis, we can achieve fantastic results and we can build upon the progress of the world in the last decades and make this planet much, much better. And let's finally embrace the slogan of the new president of France. He said the slogan should be, let's make the planet great again. Thank you so much. Thank you.